Good evening. It's good to be with you tonight. Appreciate so much the opportunity to be here to study with you tonight. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be a part of this meeting. It has been a great blessing to Nancy and myself to be here this week, and we appreciate so much your kind words, your encouraging words and prayers. Thank you for all the good work that's going on here. As Seth said just a moment ago, we did have dinner tonight with Terry and Cindy, and we had more than enough. As a matter of fact, I should have stopped sooner than I did, but nonetheless, it was a great meal, and we appreciate that so very, very much. And thank you for the hospitality that's been shown to us. I can't tell you how much we appreciate that. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you again this year. Last year, I had the opportunity to be with you. It was a great blessing, and so I'm thankful to be back this year. We are talking tonight about God in our country. That's been the theme of our study so far. And tonight I call your attention to another one of the great old prophets, a fellow by the name of Jeremiah. I would encourage you to turn with me tonight to the book of Jeremiah. And I want to begin by saying this. If there has ever been a time in our country when we needed to get back to the Bible, now's the time. We need men and women today that understand the importance of following God's Word. Sadly, we are so far removed from the principles laid down by our forefathers in the founding of this country. Many of those men and women who established America and really paid the ultimate price so that we might enjoy the blessings that we enjoy. They founded this country with a deep and abiding faith in Almighty God. They believed in the God of the Bible. They believed in the inspiration of Scripture. And they believed that the perpetuity and prosperity of our nation was tied to honoring this book that we call the Bible. So tonight as we think about Jeremiah, Jeremiah is one of the more interesting prophets of God Jeremiah began prophesying on the eve of Babylonian captivity. And Jeremiah was pleading to people that basically had forgotten the Lord. And in many respects, the people to whom Jeremiah was pleading with, those same people mirrored the people of our nation today. So as you look at the book of Jeremiah, it is relevant. And one of the things that I would stress to all of us is the relevance of Scripture. God's Word is timeless. It is always up to date, isn't it? And so as you think about Jeremiah, Jeremiah was talking to people that were about to go into Babylonian captivity. Now, the northern kingdom was taken into Assyrian captivity a little over 100 years earlier, in about 721, 722 B.C. The northern kingdom never returned from captivity. In about 605 B.C., God ultimately had the nation of Judah, that is the southern kingdom, taken into Babylonian captivity, where they spent 70 years. Someone has said in days gone by, people who do not learn from history are destined to repeat it. Sadly, the southern kingdom didn't learn from their sister. As a result of that, they paid a heavy price. So tonight I want to begin by talking about the nation of Israel forgot the Lord. Imagine that if you can. And as I read Jeremiah, there are a couple of things that stand out. Number one, the great blessings that they enjoyed by Almighty God. In Jeremiah chapter 2, Jeremiah chronicles the great blessings that Israel had enjoyed going all the way back to when God delivered them out of Egyptian bondage. In verse 5, Jeremiah said on behalf of God, Thus says the Lord, what injustice have your fathers found in me, that they've gone far from me and have, fought, and have followed idols and have become idolaters? Neither did they say, Where is the Lord who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and pits, through a land of drought and the shadow of death, through a land that no one crossed and where no one dwelt? And then God said on behalf of Jeremiah, I brought you into a bountiful country, to eat its fruit and its goodness. But when you entered, he said, you defiled my land and made my heritage 
and abomination. Now just step back for a minute and think about how God has lavished blessing after blessing upon the children of Israel. God is the source of all blessings, isn't he? Didn't the psalmist say in Psalm 68 in the long ago, Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits or blessings. James said, Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights. Every blessing we enjoy comes from the hand of God, doesn't it? Think about how richly blessed we are in this country. Do you think many people in our world today, and particularly in our nation, understand the tremendous blessings God has bestowed on those of us who live in this great land. Now we talk about freedom and liberty and the freedoms that we enjoy, they came with a price, didn't they? And yet many people have taken them for granted. And you think about how prosperous we are in this nation. Let me tell you what, you can travel around the world, and I don't care where you go, America is still the zenith when it comes to places to live in the world. It is the best of all the nations in the world. Why do you think people are trying to come here daily? Because it is a great land. Look, it's not perfect. There are a lot of problems we have in this nation, but it is still by and far the best nation in the world. And God has richly blessed us in this nation, hasn't he? So you think about the source of our blessings and then the scope of our blessings. God has blessed us providentially, it's God of whom Paul said in his great sermon on Mars Hill that is the giver of all life, breath, and all things. It's in him that we live and move and have our very being. He gave us, as Paul would say, rain from heaven, fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and glad gladness. You think about all the blessings that we enjoy, each and every one of us. Listen, it's a blessing to be able to get up in a free country, to have food to eat, to have a job to go to every day, to be able to support our kids, to send them to good schools, etc. We are blessed. The children of Israel in days gone by, they were tremendously blessed. But then what about their behavior? Jeremiah tells us there were two problems that they faced in the long ago. Number one, Jeremiah said they had forsaken the Lord. Listen to him down in verse 13. He said, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And he said, and hewn to themselves broken cisterns that hold no water. Imagine somebody digging a reservoir or putting together a cistern so that it might hold water or rainwater. And that cistern or that reservoir has leaks or cracks in it. Jeremiah is saying to the children of Israel in the long ago, look, you have forsaken me, the very living God. As he said, you have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And you have hewn for yourselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Not only had they forsaken the Lord, but Jeremiah said they had forgotten the Lord. In verse 32 of chapter 2, Jeremiah asked this question. Can a bride forget her attire or a maid her ornaments? Those of you who are ladies here tonight that are married, do you remember the wedding dress that you wore? I bet you do. I bet not only do you remember it, but I bet your husband does as well. Quite possibly. <laughs> Depending on how long ago it was. <laughs> It may be that you were in such a state of shock that you don't remember anything. But nonetheless, Jeremiah asked the question, can a bride forget her attire? In his mind, it was an incredible thing that they had forsaken and forgotten the very God that had been so good and gracious to them day in and day out. So what about us living in America today? Have we forsaken and forgotten the very God that has been so good and gracious to us? I think we could make a case for that. By and large, I think we could make a case that many, many people in our nation today do not recognize just how blessed we are. So you think about the fact, here were people that had forgotten the Lord. 
But then Jeremiah, Jeremiah chronicles the faults of the nation. And Jeremiah, in a very vivid way, identifies the heart of the problem. And really, the heart of the problem was just that. It was the heart, wasn't it? So let me just call attention to a couple of passages of Scripture. Turn over, if you would, to chapter 4, verse 22. In verse 22, he begins by talking about their ingenuity. They were ingenious. Listen to him. My people are foolish. They've not known me. He said they are foolish children. They have no understanding. Now note, they are wise to do evil. Paul in Romans chapter 1 talks about the Gentile world. And he identified one of the characteristics of those people as individuals who are inventors of evil things. There are people in our world today, if they would focus their intellect on doing things that would build up this nation, and aid this nation rather than destroy this nation, imagine how great we could be. Can you believe that we live in a nation today where people make money on a daily basis by aborting babies? Can you believe that? And you talk about wise to do evil. Individuals who have a tremendous amount of intellect. They have all kinds of ability, and yet they're, they're using that ability, that intellect, to destroy human life. The last time I read, Solomon said, God hates the hands of those who shed innocent blood. And then you think about individuals that are involved in human trafficking, selling other people, selling human beings, young and old. For what? For money. They're wise to do evil. But then he said, on the one hand, they're ingenious. On the other, he said they're ignorant. Because he said, but to do good, they have no knowledge. Is that not a fit picture of the country in which we live today? You got folks who are wise to do evil, but he said, to do good, they have no knowledge. There are some folks in our world today, they have so accentuated the dark side of life, they have no idea what it means to engage in good things or good works, to help other people, to be a servant to other people. And then turn over, if you would, to chapter 6. In chapter 6, he talks about people who were insatiable. The problem being greed or covetousness. The prophet said in verse 13, because from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, Everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. You know, one of the real problems of sin is you're never satisfied, are you? Solomon in the long ago, you remember Solomon had the opportunity to look at life from a lot of different angles. Solomon was a man, by and large, that had the opportunity to try just about everything. For example, in chapter 1, he talked about his power. He was the king over Israel, wasn't he? Over the United Kingdom, succeeding his father. And then he was popular. Everyone knew Solomon, didn't they? The queen of the south was said to have come from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Her response was, the half has, hasn't been told. And then, materially speaking, possessions. He was incredibly wealthy, wasn't he? And then he immersed himself in all kinds of pleasures. But over in chapter 5, here's what he said. He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver. What's he saying? You'll never have enough. If your aim, if your goal in life is to acquire more and more and more, listen, you will never be satisfied. Just not possible. Guy's got $100, he wants two. If he's got a million, he wants two million, right? what Solomon said. And Jesus said it like this, what shall I profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And then there's another characteristic. They had become insensitive. <clears throat> Listen to him in verse 15. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? Here's his response. No, they were not at all ashamed. And then here's what he said. 
neither could they blush. When's the last time you saw somebody blush? You know, there's a day and time when if someone said something or did something that was embarrassing, the reaction was it would cause people to blush, wouldn't it? Jeremiah said, look, the people of my day have become so desensitized to right and wrong, good and evil, truth and error, they no longer have the capacity to blush. Now you ask the question, how does that relate to America today? Let me just share with you some, some statistics that kind of put into perspective where we are in this nation. And really, what I would say is typifying the moral decline in America. The home. The breakdown of the home. About 40% of births in America are to unwed mothers. Up from 28% in 1990. 39% of marriages in the U.S. end in divorce. 33% of children are reared in this country without a biological father. We talk about absentee fathers. We talk about unwed mothers. Listen, here's what the Bible says. Psalm 127, verse 1. Except the Lord build the house, those who labor, labor in vain. If we want this country to prosper, we've got to get back to founding our homes on the Lord. It's just that simple. And then with regard to unwed mothers, Here's what Paul said, 1 Timothy chapter 5. His will was that younger women marry and then bear children. That's God's arrangement. That's God's order. And that occurs when? When two people are in a marital relationship. The Hebrew writer said, the marriage bed is undefiled. Fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Same-sex marriage. June 26, 2015. Our United States Supreme Court struck down all state bans on same-sex marriage. Legalized now in all 50 states. We would do well to go back and read history, wouldn't we? I would encourage us to go back and read the book of Genesis. What happened to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah? Peter in writing in the first century in 2 Peter chapter 2 said that when God destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, He left them an example to all who would live ungodly. That has not gone out of style. That is not outdated. And then note this. Drug usage in our country. Did you know that drug abuse and addiction cost American society more than $740 billion annually? Can you believe that? Statistically speaking, some 19 million American adults, 12 and older, battled substance use disorder in 2017, for example. Gambling. Where I live, where Nancy and I live, gambling is big business. Tunica, Mississippi is not as big as it once was, but still big. The estimated annual cost of pathological and problem gamblers in the U.S., five billion dollars. Now, who's paying for all that? I can tell you who is. We are. We are. Ninety percent of pathological gamblers gambled with their paychecks or family savings. Thirty percent of gamblers reported gambling debts ranging from seventy-five thousand to a hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Can you believe that? And we talk about sickness and disease. I can tell you what the sickness of the disease is. It's called sin. S-I-N. That's the problem in this country. It is sin. And it is eating away at the very foundation of our country. Pornography. Did you know that the pornography industry generates $12 billion in annual revenue? larger than the combined annual revenues of ABC, NBC, and CBS. It's amazing, isn't it? Of that, the internet pornography industry generates $2.5 billion in annual revenue. Listen to this. And we talk about the sickness and the sin of America and where we are as a nation. Every second, not every minute, not every hour, not every day, 
every single second, over 28,000 users are watching pornography on the internet. $3,000 every second is being spent on pornography on the internet. 372 people are typing the word adult into a search engine. That's every second of every minute, of every hour, of every day. Every day, 37 porno pornographic videos are created in the U.S. 2.5 billion emails containing porn are sent or received. That's every day. And then listen to this. Moral absolutes. According to a majority of American adults, 57% Knowing what is right and wrong is a matter of personal experience. And this view is more prevalent among younger generations than older adults, according to a Barna poll. And then the end of right and wrong. At least two generations of American young people have been taught that moral categories are nothing more than personal or societal preferences. An article appeared in the New York Times in the opinion Piece, or in the opinion section rather and the title of the article was why our children don't think about moral facts in this article the writer said without fail every value claim is labeled an opinion this extends to assessing the most glaring of evils since the Nazis thought killing Jews was right there's no way to know for sure whether or not it's wrong it's the Nazis opinion against that of the Jews and anyone else who objects this writer said, I've heard this sentiment from American high school students, including many Jewish ones, for 30 years. We are upside down in trouble in this country. You hear what I'm saying? We're in trouble. I'm just telling you, we are in trouble. The problem is sin, plain and simple. I do not have the ability to forecast the future. But I can look back in history and I can see the future of nations. They rise, they fall. There have been many fine nations that have come and gone. And I wonder, what does the future hold for America? And you look at the people in Jeremiah's day and you think, how in the world did that happen? I mean, they had been so blessed. They had been so richly, richly blessed. And yet, as Jeremiah said, they forgot the Lord. Not only did they forget him, but they forsook him. And then their failures. I mean, chronicled. You just read about it. So here's the question now. What, what was the fate of the nation? Well, we know what the fate of the nation was. They went into captivity, didn't they? Turn over to chapter 6 with me, if you would. I want you to see something in chapter 6. Herein lies the remedy for nations, for individuals, if you please, who are in sin. Here it is. Jeremiah said, Stand in the ways and see, and as for the old paths wherein the good way is, listen to him, and walk therein. You know what Jeremiah was saying in the long ago? Jeremiah was saying, if you want to get back on track, here's what you need to do. You need to get back to the Bible. The Bible is the good way. Do you not believe that in America tonight we need to get back to Scripture? Amen, we are not a theocracy. I get that. We are a republic. But we are made up of people. And you look at this nation, some, what, 300 plus million people. The answer to every problem that we face in this country is found right here in this book. It's called the Bible. That's it. The gospel is the answer. If we want to change this nation for, for the better, if we want to somehow change the landscape of this nation, we've got to get back to holding up Scripture, don't we? We've got to get back to preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you look at the New Testament and you think about the Apostle Paul and Peter and others, the message that they preached had the ability to convict the sinner and to bring about conversion of souls, did it not? If it worked then, can it not work today? The answer is yes. But if we rob God of his power, that is, if we rob him by not preaching his gospel, people will not be converted, they'll not be convicted, and guess what? People will be lost eternally. 
So you look at the first century, and you think about, in the first century, Christians were living under the Roman Empire, weren't they? That was a godless system, wasn't it? And yet Christianity thrived. Why do you think it thrived? I think one of the reasons is because Christianity offers something to people that the world does not offer. Do you believe that? You know, Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In our pluralistic age today, we've come to embrace any and everything. What's moral truth for you might not necessarily be that for me and vice versa. We no longer believe in absolutes. The Bible is dogmatic. The Bible deals in absolutes. Here's what Jesus said again. I am the way, truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. The apostle said in Acts chapter 4 verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now where then does God save people today? What is the institution, what is the nation that God has deemed the saved? I tell you, it's the church. That's it. Salvation exists in two places. Number one, in Christ Jesus. And number two, in the church of Christ Jesus. The question is, can I prove that? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10, Paul said, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may obtain salvation, listen to him, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Salvation then is where? It's in Christ Jesus. You mean to tell me I can't be saved outside of Christ? That's what the Lord said. That's what the apostle Paul said. And by the way, Paul wrote the commandments of the Lord, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37. Salvation is in Christ. Most people in the world today who have some semblance of understanding of what the Scriptures teach would affirm that salvation is in Christ. However, where we part company sometimes is how we get into Christ. The Bible says salvation is in Christ. That's right. How then do we get into Christ? Well, the Bible tells us, doesn't it? Jesus said, except you believe that I am, you'll die in your sins. In other words, unless you come to believe that I'm the very Son of God, He said, you'll die in your sins. And Jesus said, listen to this. Let me ask this question. What's the worst thing that could ever happen to you? What's the absolute worst thing that could ever happen to you in this lifetime? That's it. Right there. You can lose your job. You can lose your health. You can lose your material assets. You can lose a lot of things. But let me tell you what. You lose your soul, you have lost everything. Here's what Jesus said. Except you believe that I am, you'll die in your sins. And he said, if you die in your sins, where I am, there you cannot come. What he's saying there is, you are eternally severed from my presence. Now Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 talked about people who are without hope and without God in this world. Individuals in our world tonight, in this country tonight, who are outside of Christ... They are without hope. They are without God. The difference maker is verse 13. Paul said, but now in Christ Jesus, ye that once were far off are made nigh, brought near by the blood of Christ. So then here's the question. How do I contact the blood of Christ? You mean to tell me the blood of Christ saves me from sin? Yes, sir. Well, how do I know that? Ephesians 1 verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5, John said unto him who loved us and washed us from our sins. So I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. And then I repent. Repentance is a change of mind followed by a change of actions. And Jesus said, except you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Paul said on Mars Hill, the times of ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. That is a universal command. God expects all people to repent. And then, and then to confess with our mouth what we believe in our heart, that Jesus is the Son of God, as the eunuch did in Acts 8, verse 37. And then we're baptized into Jesus Christ. Well, why are we baptized into Jesus Christ? We've got to contact His blood, don't we? Well, where was His blood shed? It was shed in death, John 19, 34 and 35. The only way to appropriate that blood is to go where it was shed. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter 6, verse 3, Know ye not that all we who are baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. So think about it like this. Here are people in our world today, in America tonight, 
They're lost. They're separated from God. They stand in jeopardy of being severed from God forevermore. But the beauty of the gospel is we can enjoy salvation, can't we? So here's somebody who responds with a penitent heart, an obedient faith. They believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They're baptized into Christ. They contact the blood of Christ and then watch this. They are added to the body of Christ. Do you remember in Acts chapter 2 when Peter said on Pentecost Day, Repent therefore and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. In verse 41, the Bible says some 3,000 people obeyed the gospel on that day. And then in verse 47, the Bible says the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, Paul said, By one spirit were you all baptized into one body. What then is the one body? He's the head of the body of the church, Colossians 1.18. Well, how many bodies or churches are there? Does the Bible answer that? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, Paul said there's one body and one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, in you all, and above all. So we're baptized into Christ. We contact the blood of Christ. We're added to the body of Christ, which puts us among the saved, the redeemed, the cleansed. Now there are people in the world today that will tell you, They'll say you can have a relationship with Jesus on the one hand, but you don't have to have any affiliation with the church. That is not true. That's not what the Bible teaches. No, the Bible says that salvation is in Christ. And by the way, Jesus and the church go hand in hand. Sometimes people say, you know, the church was a part of God's redemptive plan. Listen, the church was God's redemptive plan. The saved are in the church. Ephesians 5 verse 23 Jesus is the Savior of the body. So that means those who are in the body are among the saved. If somebody's not in the body, they're not among the saved. Does that make sense? So, what was it Jeremiah said? Jeremiah said, Stand ye in the way and see and ask for the old past wherein is the good way. When we talk about the remedy for our nation, it is the remedy for individuals in this nation. The remedy is the same for everybody doesn't matter who you are. The remedy is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are numbered among the saved. You have the hope of heaven. Outside of Christ, all is lost. I mentioned a moment ago Ephesians 2, where Paul said somebody's without hope and without God in this world. Can you imagine standing out on the plains of eternity? And you're standing before God. And listen, we're all going to stand before God one day. We can read in Scripture about Jesus. We can talk about Jesus. We can sing about Jesus. We can think about Jesus. But one day we'll stand face to face with Jesus. Paul said, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. One day you'll be there. One day I'll be there. And the question of the hour is, what's he going to say to us? What will he say? Imagine you're standing before the Son of God. And John said in Revelation chapter 20, the books were open. That is God's Word. And the dead were judged according to the things which were written in the books. So you're going to be judged on the basis of how you've lived in this world. Does your life harmonize with Scripture? If you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ and you stand before God on that great and final day, let me tell you what, there will be no hope. None. You ever been in a situation where you thought it was hopeless? Absolutely hopeless. 9-11-2001, Nancy was in New York City. She saw the second tower fall. She saw people leap to their death from, those, from that tower. Tell me, you think those people thought they had hope? No, they didn't think that. They didn't have any hope, did they? They're crying for somebody to save them, but nobody, nobody could. They died in that building. You imagine standing before God one day. Imagine the children of Israel, the people to whom Jeremiah wrote. He is pleading with these people, begging them, stand in the way and see and ask for the old past wherein is the good way and walk therein. You know what he said? He said, you will find rest unto your souls. 
Didn't Jesus say, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, the promise being, I'll give you rest? From what? From sin. From the burden of sin. And here's what the people said incredulously. They said, We will not walk therein. They refused. They closed the door to the goodness of God. Closed the door to the graciousness of God. And I ask you tonight, have you closed the door to the goodness of God? Have you closed the door to His grace? You have to decide. I understand we are Americans, but we're human beings. We've been made in the image and the likeness of God, and one day, we're going to leave this world, whether we like it or not. If the Lord delays His coming, one day we will feel the sting of death, won't we? We're going to step outside this world into the next world. When we get into that next world, the question is, where will we spend eternity? Only two possibilities. On the one hand, you have heaven. On the other hand, you have hell. Only two. Where will you spend eternity? I feel for Jeremiah because his preaching and teaching fell on deaf ears. It's called the weeping prophet. Sadly, a lot of preaching falls on deaf ears. What's really sad is sometimes it's too late. People have gone too far. I don't know how far is too far, but I do believe that people, I do believe that people can get to a point in their life they're not turning back. They're not going to live for God. They've made that decision. The heart has become hardened. Had a buddy of mine one time told a lady. She was unfaithful to the cause of Christ. He said, don't go too far and don't, and don't stay too long. She went too far, stayed too long, and she died in sin. Conducted her funeral. Don't let that be said of you. Jeremiah was pleading with people to do the right thing. Today, we're living under the new covenant. God pleads with us to do the right thing. What's the right thing to obey the gospel? If we want to change the landscape of our nation, you know how we do it? One soul at a time, one person at a time. We have a great message, don't we? We can change this world. We can change this nation with this book called the Bible. We got to get back to the old past, don't we? If you're here tonight and you're you're not a Christian, you've never obeyed the gospel. Listen, please don't leave here tonight outside of Christ. Don't leave here tonight without hope, without God. Don't die in sin; you'll be lost. Simple as that. If you're here tonight and you haven't obeyed the gospel, the Bible is very clear, very plain. Just as I said a moment ago, salvation's in Christ. It's in the church of Christ. If you obey the gospel, God will forgive you of all your sins. Let me tell you what, the beauty of that. God will forgive your sins and he will forget your sins in the sense he will remember them no more. That's what Jeremiah, or rather, that's what the Hebrew writer said. Hebrew writer quoting Jeremiah in Jeremiah 31. But the Hebrew writer said, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. And their sins and their iniquities, listen to him, he said, I will remember no more. <clears throat> you might be here tonight and, you, and you're thinking in your heart of hearts, you know what, you have no idea what I've been doing. You don't know, you have no idea the depth of sin that I'm in tonight. Look, I get it. The world is appealing. The devil is the master of advertising, isn't he? False advertising. He'll promise you the world and he'll deliver on nothing. So you're in sin and you need the gospel. Don't let the devil keep you from doing what's right. The Bible says God will forgive any sin. He'll forgive all sin. But it's in your core. It's in my core. We have to respond, don't we? If you're here tonight, maybe you're unfaithful. Could we encourage you tonight to come back to a loving God? The beauty of God is he'll take you back. You know, I, I can just imagine when Jeremiah was preaching and teaching, God saying, look, I'm here. All you got to do is come back. But they wouldn't go back.
tonight, the question is, will you come home? John said, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Won't you come as we stand and sing? Hear the soul, why will you linger? Why